Finding the perfect 35mm point and shoot can be pretty simple. Just buy a Contax T2 and quoting Paris Hilton shirt, stop being poor. But if you are not comfortable with selling your kidney for a vacation camera and then crying why the film is so expensive, while it costs not much more than your venti pistachio latte from Starbucks, well, this video is just for you. So point and shoots were meant to be simple cameras, where all you needed to do is to point and shoot. Like smartphones today or compact digicams a few years ago. For those who regarded themselves as smarter than cameras who like to turn some dials, set aperture or shutter speed manually were SLRs and rangefinders. But the market doesn't like emptiness, so some manufacturers came up with the idea of creating a small camera but with some, let's say, professional features, mainly aperture priority mode and exposure compensation. Unfortunately, those were not very common, so today the prices are crazy. I'm talking about Contax T2, Minolta TC1, Nikon 35Ti or Fujifilm Class. Each of this is great, but for a fraction of their price you can get a 90s SLR with autofocus, full auto mode and probably a better lens. The only thing you won't get is a compact size. The second group of point and shoots are those which became iconic for some reasons. Mainly because of the lenses and some celebrities who make them popular, so Yashica T4 and Olympus Muto with Zeiss and Zuiko lenses respectively. Both are very good, with no doubt, but also both are very overpriced. Mostly Yashica, which is now over $500 and Still it's just a piece of plastic with no manual control. As for me, the quality of the lens is better than in lower class gear, but not enough to justify the price in any way. So the third group, which is actually the group of our interest, contains all other point and shoots. And I'm not gonna tell you which one is where for not buying, but we'll talk about some important features to consider to when choosing a cheap compact camera. I'm gonna use my Canon Prima 5 as an example, but just for the record, I don't want to convince you that this one is the best choice. I mean, it was for me, for the time, I was looking for something cheap, compact, with simple classic look, and also Canon have a special place in my heart, but I haven't done any research at all. So yeah, let's get it started. Well, autofocus is pretty important and kicks out all of the trash gear from our list, including all modern stuff like Kodak M35 and so on. Focus-free cameras were also quite common, so the market is filled with them. They are cheap, but work exactly like the disposable I reviewed in the previous episode. So the lens is slow to provide a large depth of field, there's probably a fixed shutter speed. The only ones worth buying are some promo products like those in the shape of a can of Coca-Cola or Pepsi or something like that. There was a lot of the stuff in the 80s and 90s with themes from movies, games, pop culture in general. They are not better, but at least look quite cool. AF point, of course, gonna be in the center, so a focus lock is a nice thing to have. So you can set the focus by half pressing the shutter and then recompose a frame. So the lenses in point and shoots are not their strong suit, like in my Prima 5. Sometimes there's vignetting, some flares while shooting against the sun. As for me, it's not a big deal. I mean, my 35mm Sigma lens is bigger than the whole camera, so it's clear that a little piece of glass or plastic won't perform in the same way. After all these years, a coating can be scratched off, so you just have to deal with it. The main thing here is to have an aperture as wide as possible. Yashica has a 3.5 lens, so as my Canon Mu is 2.8, but if you are looking for something cheaper, I think 3.5 is all you can get, and it's still quite okay. For those of you who are not yet into all those numbers, those are f-stops, and the lower f-stop means a wider aperture. Wider aperture means more light, so a camera is still gonna be useful in worse lightning conditions. Thank you. 
also it means a shallow depth of field so everything in front and behind your focus point is gonna be more blurry anyway in point and shoot we're talking about you can't force the camera to set a lower aperture and the camera itself does it very reluctantly only in a dim scenery so there will be no difference in daylight but it is still very useful like on a winter afternoon in Poland when a camera has to reach its limits a few minutes after 3 p.m. Or when you don't want to turn on the flash while shooting indoors to not scare your chubby cat. The general rule with lenses is that if a manufacturer doesn't boast about a maximum aperture it's probably because they have nothing to brag about. And as for me, I would not go into point and shoots with zoom lenses. They are more faulty, the aperture is often smaller, especially on the longer focal length, so yeah, it's only my mind on that. So as I said, overall you have no control over the point and shoot, the camera is like overprotective parents who know better what's best for you. So you have to learn to live with it or change the camera, not your parents. I mean you can if you want, but that's not the case. Anyway, when it comes to compact cameras we are talking about control space is mostly limited to turning the flash on or off. And surprisingly it's quite a helpful feature. While turning it off you can make the camera open its aperture and extend the exposure time. Then again, turning it on allows you to use it as a field flash, very useful in portraits, even on a sunny day to brighten the shadows on a face. In my Prima 5 it's designed quite nicely, because you use a slider to control the flash or set the auto mode. It means that even after restarting the camera it remains in the same position, unlike cameras with those little LCD screens where everything resets after turning it off and returns to default settings, which is generally a full auto mode, so you have to go through the the whole process again. Some cheaper point and shoots like I believe several Konica's big mini models are fitted with exposure compensation. So you can add or subtract a specific EVU value from the exposure measured by the camera. Making it simple it's gonna make a photo darker or brighter. Like when there is a lot of bright sky in the frame the camera will try to balance the whole scene so the object may not be exposed correctly and you can fix it by adding one step of exposure. So now the most important part, can cheap plastic point and shoot make any good photo? Well, I was complaining a lot about my Prima 5 and to be honest, I was not happy at all about the results. I mean, it was ok in a bright scenery with even light, but when it comes to more complex conditions like I said before, bright sky building in a shade, everything turned out much worse. But I realized one thing, inside every plastic camera there is one thing which is the game changer negative film. And before recording this video I went through some shots made with my Canon to check if there's something that could be done better during the scanning process. And well, I haven't had any problems with my lab with the rolls from the other cameras where everything was exposed correctly, but there's one thing you need to know. Negative is quite, let's say, subjective. It has to be processed before you get a final image, so the result depends on scanner settings, someone who operates it, and someone else's vision does not have to be identical to yours. Like, look at this one. It seems to be pretty correct, but as for me, it can be done better. In a few seconds I get this dreamy pastel look, I recover what was hidden in the shadows, and I am not even working with a scan but with the final image I got from the lab. Or look at this one, there's way too much contrast, of course Prima didn't expose it correctly, but still it can be fixed. And that was a thing that bothered me at the beginning of my returning to analog, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos wondering why my shots don't look just as well? Why does someone take a random point and shoot and get masterpieces? If it's because Sun LA is not cloudy Georgia? Well, perhaps it may be the reason, but the main key for me is the scanning. Probably done and edited at home, not in the first lap around the corner. So yeah, I hope this video will help you to find your perfect compact 35mm camera and get some stunning shots with it. If you have any questions you can write down a comment and as always subscribe and hit the like button if you find this episode worth it of course.